we highly encourage um, anyone of you who want a more intimate or classical style book club, possibly in person, to start one in your local area and associate it with your local affiliate to maximize the visibility and membership of WESIS. So in the meantime, for those of you too stressed for all that, relax and enjoy the conversation with us. And I'll put all of the questions um, from the book um, in the chat. Great, great. Thank you so much for doing that, Trisha. That's really wonderful. Quick word about the WESIS Code of Conduct. <clears throat> WESA's events and initiatives promote opportunities to learn, share knowledge and network. It is the intention of WESA's to create a safe, enjoyable and inclusive space for all people. I'm gonna link, I, I can link that that in chat, uh, that uh, code of conduct and, and put it down in chat here. Um, <clears throat> it's, most of us know how to behave, of course, right? But the code of conduct was recently updated and it's worth having a look at. So putting that in chat now. Um, yes, I do believe the recordings will be uh, available at some point. We are still working out the format. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to put a Zoom on YouTube and we don't quite have a word yet on how, how we wanna do these, um, but uh, stay tuned. Those are discussions that we are having with uh, WESIS Global Administration. So we just wanna make sure that everyone's happy with the decisions that we all end up making together as a team. Uh, stay tuned, right? Um, <clears throat> I would like to go ahead and intro uh, the book and the authors. The book we're discussing is Tribe of Hackers. This can be found where you get your favorite books. Is this one, is this color one? And I, I wanna draw attention to like which, which one it is because there are several of these in the, like a line, Tribe of Hackers, Tribe of whatever else. Um, <clears throat> they kind of do different ones. The authors, about the authors. <clears throat> the people that put together this book, what they did um, is, is there's a couple of them and then they compiled stuff, right? So there's Jennifer Jin. She hails from Dallas, Texas. And she is Threat Care's head of communications. She ensures all departments are running smoothly and efficiently while also owning event planning, content marketing, customer support. She knew nothing about self-publishing before Tribe of Hackers and is eternally grateful to have been hired uh, to work at Threat Care with no prior cybersecurity experience. You know, she just, she showed her her medal and uh, Marcus Carey brought her in on that. He's the creator. <clears throat> of the best-selling Tribe of Hackers cybersecurity book series. Uh, Marcus is renowned in the cybersecurity industry and has spent his more than 20-year career working in penetration testing, incident response, digital forensics with federal agencies such as NSA, DC3, DIA, and DARPA. He started his career in cryptography in the U.S. Navy, and he's got a master's in network security. Uh, Marcus is passionate about giving back to the community through things like mentorship, hackathons, speaking engagements, and he's a voracious reader in his spare time. So maybe someday we can get him on the <laughs> get him on here. It would be great to, to interview him. Um, so why do we choose this book? The last two books we reviewed were aimed at a general audience, <clears throat> aimed at the general public. This time we wanted to pick something that speaks directly to cybersecurity professionals. And this seems like the right place to discuss advice from the best hackers in the world, call me crazy, um, <laughs> but we also endeavor to be inclusive with our selection of authors as well, so that a lot of these things play into the factors of how we choose our book. Um, all right, let's get to it. Uh, I just want to open the discussion uh, by asking, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, bringing up the format and, and asking, Trisha, what did you think of the format? This is a weird format for a book, do you think? <laughs> Well, Joanna, that's a great question. So I have to say that the format um, for me is writ was written more like a reference guide <clears throat> than in narrative form. Yeah. So the format definitely took me by surprise. I had no idea upon ordering <clears throat> Tribe of Hackers, it was going to be the same questions asked of 70 diverse uh, cybersecurity <laughs> professionals with various backgrounds, experiences, and expertise. But initially, I re um, the read seemed very redundant to me and snoozeworthy. So, you know, <laughs> I had to like, man. But in the end, I was able to jot down a lot of takeaways and solid advice from those um, interviewed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and we're gonna ask you, the audience, to weigh in on this format question. Uh, Kiana, you wanna put up the first question for us? I would appreciate it. But, I, you know, I went back and forth 
between, you know, liking that I could just kind of pick it up quickly and then put it down quickly. Um, I did miss kind of the narrative story feel. And, um, you know, I, I felt that the answers did, like you said, it was it kind of became stale and more a little bit like a reference book than, uh, you know, than, than kind of a, a nice narrative being told as the pages go on. Um, I feel like it might have actually worked better as a whole. And this is just my opinion. People can disagree with me, but I felt like it might have worked better as a whole with either fewer questions or maybe just a shorter book. <laughs> um, but, but that aside, I, I did, you know, I did get to pick out some really good gems. I found some really good stuff. Everybody, if you take a look at your screen, there will be a poll question that has popped up. Please answer. Um, <clears throat> my answer is going to be a little of both <laughs> because I just, you know, I, I kind of teetered back and forth. I was like, all right, so this is sort of refreshing, you know, in one way, because it's not your typical book, but then it, is, it got a little redundant. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Trisha, I know you had some, uh, some, some more thoughts on that. I think you said as far as yeah, um, so I just I'm in between. Um, I'm going to be putting the questions in the chat for everyone. Oh, um, I was, it. yeah, okay. I, um, the questions from the book, but I wasn't able to copy and paste it. So I'll just type them out one by one. But um, back to um, ooh, back to you, Joanna. Um, after okay. after I dedicated time to read the book, um, I would say like the third on the third attempt, I began to appreciate the advice they gave regarding password management, social media, posting online and setting up multi-factor authentication, which mm. we all can directly or indirectly relate to, um, whether it's us, our family, our kids, you know, just um, people that we know. Um, we have generations of young people who definitely need to be cognizant about these and other things related to cybercrime threats, fraud, and attacks. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. Um, I loved it. There was one line uh, that, that I loved. It was, it was kind of funny. They said, do we really need an internet connected toaster, right? It was one of the, the things that I think it was Ken Johnson, right? It, it really highlights how ridiculous I think IoT has gotten and how we definitely all relate to that. So I, I, can, I can definitely appreciate what you say there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over the answers here and then we can talk about chat. Um, question one. Oh, I was trying to be funny with that. I pretty much hated it, but no one answered that. Okay, that's really good to know. So we don't have any bitter book club members yet. <laughs> um, so most, it looks like we, we have a nice um, division here. So we have, you know, I love the change of pace, not a bad format at all. That was 29 percent, a little bit of both 25 percent. And it looks like quite a few people, they, you know, they didn't have a chance to read it or maybe they didn't finish it or they just don't really have a strong opinion about about the question in general. Um, <clears throat> some of the comments in chat, let's see here is, oh, well, we got quite a few here. OK, um, I like the format because diverse opinions. Uh, yeah. Um, she says she agrees with Erica. I'm going to go back up to Erica. I'm familiar with the inspiration for this book, Tribe of Mentors. So it wasn't unfamiliar, um, but some people's sections read easier than the others, right? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it was nice to be able to read one set of questions per person. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people had the, had the same things to say. For one of the questions. It was nice to be able to pick it up and read one at a time. I, I did really like that. I was able to just, all right, well, if I want to stop reading, I don't have to like wait to finish the chapter, right? It's just, they're so neat and, and short. Um, Teresa Reinhardt says, my first time at this book club, uh, not my first time at a book club. This was a good read for a cybersecurity professional. It's more of a survey and not a narrative. Yeah, it's true. Um, and Karen says, I think this would be a great read for college students had a few look at this and for them to any new technical career or any technical career, then get something from interviewees that did not resonate with others. That's true, that's true. I think you're right. Also, especially with the younger crowd, like, like especially younger college students because old people go to college too, right? <laughs> but the younger college students, right? They tend to have kind of shorter attention spans. So this format I think is really one of those that's very friendly to the, the shorter attention span generation. Um, and that's not, that's not a dig. That's just, you know, we're all diverse people. We all have different things, you know, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's unique and interesting, I think. Um, Erica Brown says, I spent some time one afternoon flipping through each of the chapters to extract their suggestions for movies, books, and podcasts. Yeah, now I have a list of things to follow up on. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic too. Um, replying to, I think this will be balancing it with the social media cybersecurity forms, of course. Yeah. Um, IoT is probably one of the most targeted attack surfaces. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and it's, it's also just kind of, crazy. I, I, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but it feels insane how, how much is out there. I don't need an internet connected toaster. I'm pretty sure I don't need, you know, or Google tracking, like, you know, how often I make toast. Like, I just, I don't feel like, I know somebody somewhere is going to buy that data, but I don't feel like it's, you know, uh, a value add to my life at all. I think it's just one more thing I have to protect and set up and secure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's been, it's been that, um, I do, we, whoo, we got a lot of messages going down here. I'm just trying to skip around a little bit, might not get to every single comment. <clears throat> the format was like a reference guide. Yeah. That's basically what I thought. Personal experience being in school, currently getting my degree in cybersecurity, not knowing about the different specific roles within cyber. It helped to narrow down pathways to be able to take for a specific role. Emily Crows, yeah, yeah, it was the one I felt impacted by the most. She's a super geek like me, and her pathway is what I aim to go through. Santina says breaches will always happen. Yes, they will. They absolutely will. Um, <clears throat> see here, Q3. Breaches are a part of this very connected world we're living in today. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I think that... Um, one thing that's really fun is, is that we as industry professionals or people trying to break into the industry, we can read this and we can have our own answers to these questions and, and really kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to challenge the things that, that I find. So I, I found, um, and I'm just going to tell you what I found with some, I picked out some sort of unique answers uh, in the book. Um, I had one was if you'll just give me a second here on page 33 was Leslie Carhart. I know a lot of a lot of these people I think y'all may be familiar with. Um, I know I've been following some of these folks for for years. Um, so it was kind of nice to see their their names again in the book. Um, but Leslie Carhart says uh, under the question is there's a myth you could debunk in cybersecurity. Um, a good security professional studies the technical minutia of their niche. A great security professional also studies business operations and assists their senior leadership in making pragmatic risk decisions that balance operations and security. I thought that was really fantastic. I mean, that, that's just a quote at the end. Her, her answer to the question, um, you know, it's kind of this myth that, you know, that, that security people are securing things in the security IT area, and they're not. A lot of us are working in any other industry, but... IT or security, right? We're just security people in any, any business, right? In any organization. Um, and if we understand that and we can apply that, then we don't come to uh, an environment that's unique and say, well, why don't you just, you know, lock down the network? And it's like, well, no, because the purpose of the company is to do these other things and that interferes, right? So um, I, I think that was kind of a, a unique take on that question. It wasn't one of the more redundant answers. Um, another one, and I love, I love this question. I love the life hack question. You know, what's a life hack that you'd like to share that, that came up um, a lot. And uh, one person, Deirdre Diamond, she, um, she said, for me, it was understanding that my brain is a program that chooses my emotions for me, the unconscious brain. I can choose to run the emotional program my brain has already developed at a young age, or I can reprogram it. I chose to reprogram it and boy, did my life get much easier when I learned to consciously choose when I feel sad, mad, happy, guilty, and so on. And I get to choose how long I let this emotion live at any given time. I am 100% accountable to my emotions. I hacked my own brain. It was and is a constant focus. I thought that is a unique answer, right? That is, that is interesting. She hacked her own brain. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have that kind of 
Uh, I mean, I'm pretty introspective, I like to think, but I'm not sure I have that kind of self-control to not, you know, just go, okay, well, I'm mad right now, but I'm just not going to feel that anymore. <laughs> Trisha, do you, do you resonate with that at all? Yeah, I can relate. I can relate, definitely. Yeah, it's, it can be a challenge for sure. Um, so, oh, and there's also a really funny one. Uh, there's a uh, really hilarious it made me laugh out loud and that didn't happen very often in this book there were just a couple but it was one question it was a what qualities do you believe all successful cybersecurity professionals share and the answer from Davi Ottenheimer was brevity (laughs) one word only one word answer in the whole book and I thought that was just hilarious because brevity it's brevity it's it's short um but I'm, I'm definitely, there's, there's nothing brevity about me. I'm (laughs) going to go on and on and on. Um, but yeah, it was, it was funny. I, I laughed pretty hard at that. Um, I want to go ahead and put up question number two. Uh, did you disagree with anyone's answers to these questions? Uh, and then of course, put your thoughts in chat as always, I'm going to scroll down and look at some of these other, we got quite a few things that people have said, um, Q4 is a hard one. Depends on motivation. If you're driven to learn on your own, you will get it. Yeah. Santina says study and network with others. Mm. Uh, See Q7. Q7 was what is your advice for career success when it comes to getting hired, climbing the corporate ladder or starting a company in cybersecurity? Um, Anna says networking is the key. Never burn bridges. It is such a small world. True facts. Uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, Let's see, I don't see any other Q7 answers yet. I do, and we're just kind of, you know, uh, Trisha's just kind of poking the questions around, keep keep y'all's thoughts and opinions. But I'm gonna go back to question two, which we posted on the poll. Again, did you disagree with anyone's answers? Um, I would say most people were pretty on target. <clears throat> I didn't disagree with anyone super strongly. I thought maybe some answers were a bit short-sighted uh, or only represented a homogenous or very singular point of view. Um, I also noticed, and I don't know if anybody else felt this at all, but uh, younger responders seem to have kind of these more open-minded answers. And I, I thought that showed. Um, and kind of, kind of pulled that up. Uh and we can go ahead and finish up the poll. Um, Kiana, do you want to share those poll results? <clears throat> okay. Did you disagree with anyone? Yes, absolutely. Ooh, we got a yes, absolutely. Someone disagreed. I want to know what you disagreed with. Throw that in there. Um, <clears throat> and if you think you're getting lost in the comments, um, you know, let me know. Uh, I think the idea of hacking my own brain is a great way to get <clears throat> into the topic of psychology. I feel lots of people in this profession aren't tapped into their emotions at all, which is doubly hard when dealing with major issues and stress. I agree. I think I've, I've run into quite a few people that are not always in touch with what they're feeling, you know, lashing out at coworkers sometimes. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I have a frog in my throat at the moment. I, I apologize. Uh, let's see, here we go. Question 12. Let's see, we're going to skip over that. Yeah, not seeing any, um, not seeing anything regarding the disagreement, but that's fine. Uh, I think most of us agreed that most of the people when they're answering questions were pretty on target. Um, some people said there's so many different answers. It was really just a blur. Um, and I, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, okay. I don't know why that message is popping up, but I'm going to try this. Okay. <clears throat> and, and Trisha, it looks like she posted the, the last question. So they're all in there. Question three is cybersecurity spending increasing LOL. Yes. <laughs> I, I agree. I thought was that kind of I kind of thought that was a little funny too. Like, well, obviously, um, it's a little bit, a little bit obvious. Um, but some of the most common answers to the myth question, and do you need a degree question? 
uh, I want to talk about that for a minute. Just the, you know, a lot of people said, you know, you don't need a degree to work in cybersecurity. Um, I myself do not have a degree. And yet I have had what I feel is a high level of success in the industry. Um, you know, I am a security analyst. I'm continuing to learn and I love what I do. Um, and so, you know, I feel like I'm living proof that you don't have to have a degree. Um, but I, I do, I do feel it, it, you know, it's something that I would love. I would love to have one and, and may be able to work towards one in the future. Trisha, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I do. Um, based on my own experience working for the government sector for the past 24 years, um, um, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a career changer. So I switched over into the IT field um, about a year and a half ago. Um, so basically just to get your foot in the door um, in um, my department, um, you had to have at least an associate's uh, degree in technology or some other, you know, like computer science, you know, whatever uh, it was related to, but you had to have at least an associate. So I guess it all depends on the employer as well as the private versus um, public sector. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Yeah, so I also have a degree in a master's in cybersecurity. And so what I'm finding in my search and crossing over into a cybersecurity role is that employers um, look not only for experience, they look for certifications. So I currently don't have any certifications. I'm working on that. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with those who answered otherwise in the book. Um, but, you know, it's a great conversational piece. Um, some of the let me um, give two quotes from the books that I wrote down related to um, the subject. So Andrew Bagrin um, from on page 11 of the book, he said mm -hmm. some of the best cybersecurity professionals I know do not have any degrees or certificates. However, education is always a good thing and does help. So on page 12, Andrew um, also quotes Always continue to learn and stay on top of what's going on. The SISEC work advances quickly and is easy to be left behind if you don't stay in tune with that world. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree for sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think that uh, I, I would love to be able to just you know drop what i'm doing and and not do quite so much work so that i could focus on getting a degree um but a, a lot of the time when you think oh is it it's a means to an end if if, if it's a means to an end well, the end i already have I, you know i have i have a job that i love and i contribute and i and i get it done um and like i said i feel like i have some you know personal success whatever success means to me right it's an interesting question because we we talk about this and Success is, what does that mean? It's different for everyone. Um, and I think a few few of the answers reflected that that opinion, but um, you know, I, I, I love these, these answers. I love that all things are possible. Um, but yeah, if you are, if you're gonna go into management or you're going to, you know, try to do some sort of executive level work, you, you pretty much need something. You need a degree, even if it's in, the wrong topic. They they want they want that checkbox. They want that marked. Um, smaller companies can avoid that, but larger companies with HR departments, they won't let you get far without that. So, I think for me, the the answer comes down to the role. What's the role you want? If you want to be a CISO, unless you're CISO of your own startup company, you know chances are high you're you're gonna have you're gonna have a hard time finding that job without a degree. Um, and that's, I think that's something we all can have a little bit of relation to. Uh, Karen says, I've been teaching over 20 years and uh, unfortunate uh, for bigger jobs need some type of degree. My alumni have been keeping in touch with me for decades and still indicate, as they, yeah, it, it's true. Um, <clears throat> replying to been teaching over 20 years and fortunate for bigger jobs need a degree. Yeah. Some tried without a degree and came to, I guess, community college to get a degree. Yeah. So they could get certain jobs. Yeah. And work. Yeah. That's true. And if, if I did go back to school, I'd probably have to start with a community college. Right. 
Um, <clears throat> and I, I have some college, but my background's in accounting. So, if, I mean, I'd pretty much be starting from scratch, you know, um, <laughs> if, I, if I wanted anything related to cyber or IT. Um, Tammy Rose says recruitment. I keep hearing that cyber needs so many people from so many different fields, but I keep seeing that certifications are a priority. They seem to understand that there's a huge need to train people, but organizations don't want to train people. They want them to hit the ground running. No, I agree with that. That is a big challenge. And I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to work on a, a proposal to, to have a talk about this because um, at, at a conference coming up, because it's just, it's so important to reach executives in every industry and get this, you know, in front of them. You have, you know, you say you have a, a, a gap here and you can't fill roles, but I know so many, and mostly women, I know so many women who have certs or they have, you know, like, like Trisha, they've got, they've got this cybersecurity masters, right? They're, they're, they're getting these kinds of things and they're showing up saying, I'm ready to work and no one will hire them. And it's right. like, what, why? Yeah, they want, yeah, they're not hiring. Uh, they want you <laughs> to have the experience at an entry level. So, yeah, they need to have five years of experience for an entry Yeah, level. they need to redefine entry level and they need to develop these entry level training programs, um, internships, apprenticeships, whatever they need to do to give pe people, you know, especially women, I'm advocating for women, right. opportunities to, um, you know, transition over into a cybersecurity career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Santina White says, I like Kelly Lum's response. She's paraphrasing here. She went to school because she's disorganized. Yeah, that's that was a pretty good response too. Um, uh, Teresa Reinhardt says, uh, the answer to question 14, my biggest mistake was trusting my ex. I recovered by finding my voice and leaving him. Solidarity sister, I did the same thing <laughs> with my first husband. I got, I got an upgrade, this nice, nice, husband 2.0. <laughs> um, Jen H says, it depends on the organization as far as getting someone to train you. Government is a good place to get training. They will develop their people. Civilian position in a military organization will also develop you. Yeah. Some commercial organizations will train you. They're just harder to find. No, it's so true. It's so true. Um, Tammy Rose says, I think accounting is a huge advantage. There are so many jobs that require detail-oriented for serious details. Yeah, personality. I think that uh, gives you a great advantage in personality. It's very, very true. My, my having to learn how to be detail-oriented doing accounting has become so valuable. It's really not at all dissimilar from comb, like, right, combing through budgets is not dissimilar to combing through logs. And sitting there and looking, you know, okay, I've got to find this. All right, this connection happened here, this IP to this IP, and I'm looking for that. And you're almost trying to find a needle in a haystack sometimes. Um, and you've got to be able to have those detail-oriented, you know, practices. So, yeah, I mean, Tammy, if you were hiring, you'd be like, oh, having an accounting background isn't going to hurt you in the cybersecurity world, right? Exactly. Um, Cherry Chitwood says, I agree, entry-level jobs have changed. They really have. I mean, there's no reason if if you know, it used to be IT would handle phishing tickets, for example. Well, now handling phishing tickets is going to be more of a security team's responsibility. And I don't think you need a degree to handle phishing tickets. For, you know, call, call me crazy, but, you know, we've got our student interns doing that kind of stuff um, most of the time. Uh, and so it's... It, it's there's definitely things that you can put under the uh, entry level category that can help people break into the field. Um, and if you just really want them to have a bigger understanding of security, well, then grab some of these people with certs and degrees who don't have job experience and throw them in there. They're really they're really they're out there. They're willing to work. I, I meet them all the time. Um, Anna T says, remember, 15 K or 10% layoffs at FANG just from yesterday. It's not you, it's everyone. Well, I'm not sure what FANG is, F-A-A-N-G. Does can someone want yeah, to it's a, it? it's a big tech, you know, Facebook, right? Google, Amazon, whatever, Microsoft is not there. So mm -hmm. we're talking about big, big tech, right? Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. So this is Anna. I'm a cyber and strategic risk consultant at Deloitte. 
Um, I know a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my friends have been laid off as part of the um, big layoffs uh, at the at the the big tag in the past um, I don't know a couple of weeks and a month and it's just been horrible you know we've been sitting crying together we've been you know drinking together we've been doing all these things because you know we all working together right and I have so many clients that are you know from these companies and um, forgive me for saying this but this is this is just not you this is we all in such a vulnerable place at this time. Um, that we have to think about everything about our colleagues, you know, talking about networks and everything. We have to think about people, you know, that are just like us and they lost their jobs. And we're not talking about somebody who's starting in tech or cyber. We're talking about um, sophisticated, very talented engineers who've been at their jobs for years, for 10, 20 years. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, to comment on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's 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 going to be tough. I mean, my my prediction, um, it's going to be very tough in the next year or two to break into the industry. But nonetheless, does not mean that you shouldn't try and you shouldn't go for it. Um, and by the way, I do refer people. So if anybody is looking for entry level jobs, I am inviting you to email me your resumes. Um, please do so. And I will drop that in the chat. Thank you. OK, so do you? Yeah. Drop your email in the chat. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Patricia Gonzalez Villa, or Villa, I'm not sure which one. Um, I have been a teacher and I am promoting STEM for my students because I love engineering. I have two masters, but in administrations and organizational development. But now I want to work in cybersecurity. And this is a common thing that I hear. My bachelor's in computer science, hope to find a job to transition in the WESIS conference. I'm detail oriented too. And I know that the skill is very valuable for security practitioners. Yeah. It, it really is. Uh, Fang, former names, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Yes. So I have heard about there's been a lot of layoffs in general. Um, I've, I've been hearing that. I don't think I've ever seen those. I just think it's like, oh, the big the big companies, right? <laughs> but bang, okay, I'm going to save that for later. I'm going to try and remember that. Um, let's see. Teresa answered question 12, password management and uh, using guest network for IoT. Yeah, I saw that answer more than once. Make it hard on the attackers by utilizing simple things in, to develop defense in depth. Yeah, love defense in depth. It's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer Langdon says, former middle school science teacher here. My master's, oh, it just jumped. My master's includes educational technology. That's how I started to learn I was good at computers. Yeah. And that's the other thing. So many of us when we were younger, either we didn't, we weren't privileged enough to have access to computers. Right. And so we didn't, we didn't have that sort of break in that opening. Um, and then some of us were just not encouraged in this area. Uh, you know, people, oh, you know, you're, you know, you should go look at English, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, to steering women, even subconsciously away from STEM is, was so common uh, for I don't know my generation. I think for a lot of millennials, I think it's getting better. I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot less of that with Gen Z. I'm I'm super excited with with how proactive our teachers are becoming at getting women into. I was in Jennifer Langdon says yeah. <laughs> I was encouraged to pursue a degree in English. Exactly like me too. And it was like yeah. I mean, but I'm already kind of good at that. Like I feel like why just double down on something like I want to focus on something that I'm maybe not necessarily good at because now I can learn it and then I can become good at it like I don't know to me that's how I always approached um education was you know if I'm already really good at something I'm, I'm not going to spend a bunch of money to learn more about it I think that um I want to focus on things that I don't know anything about but that's because I love learning I love learning all kinds of new things so yeah Trish just challenge yourself right um, Lainey McGlowan, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, cybersecurity requires constant learning. It does. I really agree with that. And that was one of the answers we saw throughout the book quite a bit. Um, I would like, uh, Kiana, do you want to put up question three? For those of you who are actively working in the industry, are you planning to go back to your workplace with any strong recommendations and attempt to push those narratives? I, I mean, this was kind of this this became important to me as I was continuing to read the book. All of these ideas started coming up about my own workplace and all, my own things that I want to take to my management and to, you know, to the CISO and say, hey, you know, here's some of the things that our industry believes, you know, our industry professionals believe is the most important thing 
And we should be focusing on that. We should definitely double down on focusing, right? And I think one of the, the common themes I saw was stop buying tools and invest in your people, whether that's training, whether that's hiring uh, people, uh, pro, you know, professionals or superstars that are really good at that. Um, so I, I found a lot of ideas and things that I can take and drop little, like, little hints in meetings, little seeds here and there that hopefully will grow and sprout later. I highly encourage everyone to do that. Um, yeah, Kiana, do you want to go ahead and post the uh, poll results for that one? Sorry, all my cats uh, meowing to get in. <laughs> um, all right, we got our answers. For those of you actively working in the industry, are you going to go back to your workplace? 67% said yes. I have many ideas. That's great. 13% um, said not really. My team knows this stuff probably, or maybe you're just not, you don't feel like your team would listen. That's also sometimes a thing. You want to make sure of that. And then, you know, the small percentage of people who are, are in attendance and no pressure ever to read the book. You can come join us and join the discussion without having read it. Um, Jen H says, I found I was often paying too much attention to what I was doing and not picking up my head and noticing others that need help. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen that that can happen. Uh, Teresa Reinhardt jumped in. Yeah. My parents flat out said that my brothers needed to get better educations than the girls. So glad I paid no attention to that logic. Yeah. We are too. <laughs> We're glad you're here for sure. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, we have a, we have just a couple more um, from Erica Brown. Mm -hmm. She said it took me until recently reading Tribe of Hackers and doing the Try Hack Me advent of cyber to realize that I started my hacking skills in the mid 80s, figuring out how to hack a computer game I had. But then I went away from the tech side for over 20 years as I was working full time, writing documentation and raising my kids, being a single mom with my mom's help, and now and I'm only now getting back into it. And then um, Olukimi Olanirin, I'm sorry. Um, she's a lecturer in project management, but her PhD is in cybersecurity risk management implementation. Yeah. So yes, that's great. It is, that is. I mean, it's, uh, I, I love how, you know, how, how much diversity there is in, in our, you know, our, our groups, especially within WESIS, you know, when we start talking to each other, when we realize we have strengths all over the map and it's, it's nice to see where, where people are coming from. Um, one of the best responses I saw time and time again was to invest in security staff, right? And focus on a culture of security with awareness training. Um, I have, I'm going to read a couple of quotes that I found and I have to find the right... I have so many tabs. <laughs> so Tuta Hasseni, I believe is how you say her name. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but we'll see about that. She says, security posture of an organization is greatly impacted by the level of security awareness or security culture slash readiness of the organization. And I've seen this time and again, right? Having a culture of security can really make people feel like they've bought in to what you're selling. And if they if they feel like they're welcome to be a part of cybersecurity at an organization, you're gonna have a more secure organization. I mean, so, so having that awareness training, and we're not talking about the 30 minutes or an hour you're requiring everybody to take once a year to check an HR box. I'm talking about really having conversations or really making it a part of an onboarding process that, oh, hey, you know, we really care about security. We know you do too. And then uh, one thing that I implemented at my organization that I'm, I'm pretty proud of is I said, we need to start saying to everyone, thank you for continuing to keep, you know, uh, a security, a culture of security here at this organization. And when you do that, when people start to, and I've, I've read books on this, when people start to identify things like that, like a security mindset as a part of their identity, then they do become more secure and they care more. And so people always say, oh, no one cares. Well, convince them that they already care and they will care more. And this, this is, you've seen this time and time again, there are studies that back this up. If you convince people that they care, they will continue to care and, and really actively 
uh, implement that. There's another quote on page 234. That's Khalil Sahnawi, I believe. And I looked up how to pronounce that because I want to make sure I try to whenever I can not butcher names. <laughs> so and Khalil says um, for the, the biggest bang for the buck action question, right? He's as far as I'm concerned, that's an easy one. Awareness training. This is probably the cheapest and easiest action an organization can take but one that will have the most positive effect on its information security posture. The weakest link in any organization is the human element. You can have all your sophisticated products in one place, but if you don't train your users and define proper procedures, they can render all of that moot in a second. And it's, it's true, but I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, pro, not just a little box, right? Not just checking off the box of, oh yeah, we gave the, we forced them to watch a boring video for 20 minutes, right? Like it's, are we really, are we having conversations or are we making it engaging? Maybe even gamifying uh, training, which a lot of companies are getting big on now. Um, <clears throat> looking at some comments here. Uh, training is huge at Nationwide. This is from Teresa Reinhart. Uh, we not only have an educational reimbursement allotment per year, but we have every Thursday afternoon blocked out for internal training and are, are measured on how much training we actually do, not that we can get done what we need to get done if we take all that time for training, but they are very focused on it. And I love companies like that. I, I really feel validated when they're like, yeah, yeah, take your time, you know, stop what you're doing and, and really study. Um, Erica Brown says, not from the book, but I've been looking for podcasts that would be helpful as I'm learning, but I keep finding these really long ones, like one hour each session, and it's just too much for me to fit into my day regularly. Does anyone here have any podcasts they could recommend? Preferably under 30 minute timing. That's a great question. You know, I've I've looked at and listened to quite a few cybersecurity podcasts, and I can't think of one that fits that description. So, you know, there sounds like there's a need. I encourage those who like to like to make things that they wish existed maybe make one on your own, like discover something and then find a way to, you know, teach it in a 20 minute, 30 minute uh, little podcast session. Yeah, I haven't heard of any podcasts, but I know there's um, a whole uh, lot of YouTube channels. That, there are. There are yeah, you, you, and YouTube videos that you could probably find in that time, you know, under 30 minutes. Oh, you know, who's really good at that? Now that you say that, I'm just thinking uh, Network Chuck. You go to YouTube and look up Network Chuck. Oh man, he's great. He cuts his his so tight that I have to slow down his videos, but they're short. They're great and they're short. He'll be like, here's 60 things you know you can learn in 10 minutes, right? Here's 40 Linux commands that you must know. And and here and here I'm gonna show them all to you in like 10 minutes. And you're like, whoa, I mean it's it's great. He's fantastic. He also breaks down a lot of network concepts really simply, such that it's really accessible to people who are new to the field. So if you're new to the field and you don't know much about networking, watch him. He's fun. He's fun and interesting. Um, LinkedIn networking is your best friend, Anna says. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Jen H says it's a little long, depending on episode, but I do appreciate Darknet Diaries. Yeah, that's one of the most popular. That's a fun one. I think it can really help people get a sense of because uh, he he targets the general audience. So if you're new, you can kind of get into things. But if you already know stuff, it's still riveting, uh, even to our people, our professionals in our in our area. Uh, Karen says, Joanna, what you read on training, number two, Ian had a great quote. Oh yeah, Ian did have a great quote about, there will be at least one user who's having a bad day and makes a mistake. It's true. I don't think, I don't think of like, I know there are a lot of cybersecurity professionals who kind of go, oh, well, the humans are the problem, right? It's, they're going to mess up, whatever. But dude, even cybersecurity professionals, and I've seen many admit that, you know, they've made a mistake. Um, and I think even the fact that one of the questions that they're asking is about, you know, what mistakes have you made and what have you learned from them? Um, so let's see, Tammy Rose says, yes, if you can't find the thing you want, make it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Lauren John says, Bright Talk holds several webinars. Um, Karen reacted to with a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, Anna says, misconfiguration attacks are still dominating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's common. Erica Brown says, I did find one this morning, CyberWire Word Notes, with a recent episode about Pegasus. Oh, it's nine minutes. You know what? 
I have listened to Cyberwire, and yeah, it is. It's pretty quick. They they do go through things pretty quickly. I don't know exactly if if I would think of it as training, not more like news dissemination, but maybe maybe if you know if, if anything, it's a jumping off point, right? To to maybe do a deeper dive on whatever it is there they're saying is the big deal. Um, Laney says we hack purple is a place to look to. Yep. Is it cyber Chuck? No, I'm pretty sure it's network Chuck. Um, pretty sure I'm almost positive. Um, but if you, if you find any changes name or maybe I'm wrong, I'm, I'm always willing to admit I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, Gwen McAvoy says I changed careers by completing a cyber boot camp. I was so excited and curious about the field and love the ongoing discussion among students and graduates. When I got my first cyber job, though, I was surprised to find maybe only one or two of my coworkers were similarly interested and excited about cybersecurity, such as via sharing podcast recommendations, free courses, webinars, cyber thrillers, and so on. It was disappointing, but I got to acknowledge that for many people, this is just a job. We just and other orgs are filling that gap, though. I, I agree. There, you're always going to find people who are, you know, I guess we call them now quiet quitters. People who are like, I'm just going to show up and do do my job, from eight to five, and then peace out, right? Um, and that's yeah, we had a um, we had a student <laughs> worker. Even though, like, my employer knew that, um, you know, I was interested in cybersecurity. You know, at the time, I was still on probation, but um, they um, placed a student worker in the security. Um, section. And so what happened was the senior um, IT engineer um, didn't really have time to um, train the student worker. And then, you know, there's a lot of permissions you have to grant. So they really didn't have access. Uh, the student worker didn't have access to a lot of things. And so basically the student worker was just sitting there like being bored out of, you know, his mind and he asked to be moved. He wasn't interested in cyber. Wow. So, and I feel like that that may have been kind of a little bit of a failure to show, right? When you have students come on board, like show them what what's interesting, show them what can be exciting about this or or where you can just immediately make a difference. Because for a lot of people, making a difference is huge in the job, especially this is really important with Gen Z, y'all. I mean, Gen Z is, uh, the, I think the latest polls are showing that one of the most important things to them has nothing to do with money. They're willing to give up money if they feel like they're making a difference. Um, and that's just not true of all generations. It's just not, um, you know, millennials, uh, they, they value, I think, a little bit more having opportunities and also making a difference. But for them, it's more about opportunities and making sure that they have access to the things they want access to and, and the ability to, to uh, prom uh, get promotions, right, to get promoted. Um, uh, Trisha, did you have any more thoughts on uh, security awareness training? Yeah, I, so I strongly feel that in this day and age, um, security staff and awareness training is a must. I think the... Um, you know, older generation realizes that. But on page 230 of the book, um, Shin Yer Swartz, um, she quotes, people rely too much on technology to protect them instead of looking at how their actions or inaction make them vulnerable to attack. So in protecting information and systems, organizations should have countermeasures in place to assist employees in knowing what to do to prevent a cyber attack, as well as what not to do in order to invite like possible attacks through careless actions and human error. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. We have 30 new messages, so I'm going to start going through some of those. Uh, Again, I apologize if I can't read every single comment. I'm doing my best to try and make sure we're grabbing the comments that stay on topic. Um, Jen H says, I might be biased, but I like the B-Sides conferences for learning opportunities that are reasonably priced and on weekends. So you can go on your own without needing an employer to fund it. This is absolutely true. This is one of the things that I love about B-Sides is almost every major city has one. And, uh, and if it doesn't, it's, it will soon because so can you explain that? Business. Can you explain so, what the B-sides? Oh, sure, sure. B-sides. So, um, the, in much the same way as we used to, you know, for those of us who are analog, right. They used to have vinyl and, uh, and, and tapes, right. There's, um, you know, you, you, you'd have a, a the B-side, you'd have side A and side B and the B-side is kind of this, nece not necessarily as popular 
uh, not as many people going, not as many people involved or kind of thing. Um, so you know, applied to conferences. So you might have DEF CON, right? In, and it's in Las Vegas, but then there's the Las Vegas B-sides, which is like, it takes a few of the ideas from something like DEF CON in a smaller, tinier format. You're going to have mostly local people attending, mostly local people speaking, and you're going to have um, often, not always, but the great majority of the time they try to make it free or super low cost, like 20 bucks to get in or something. So those are B-sides conferences. And you can find those in a lot of major, most of the major cities have them. Um, and if they don't, they, they will soon because we are, we're an army and we're, we're getting it going for sure. Um, so yeah, so that was the, thank you, Jen, for, for mentioning that. Cherry agrees. Uh, B-Sides is where it's at. I've learned a lot attending conferences. Uh, Gwen says, great idea at Dion. I don't know. I don't think I, I may have missed Dion's idea. Security awareness ideas is what Dion says. In my organization, I've implemented a three paragraph article. The different members from the cybersecurity team rotate to write each month in the company newsletter, the cybersecurity corner. That's very cute. I love it. Every once in a while, we'll throw a $25 Amazon gift card raffle to those who submit the challenge questions. Easy way to engage workforce and keep them updated on relevant issues in the company. Yes, we also have a, a, a newsletter. It mostly goes out to IT, but um, but that's because we're a huge organization. But um, but that's that's really cool. That is a great idea. Anybody who wants to grab that idea and just, you know, run it forward to run it up the chain to your your management that's a great fantastic idea uh anna says if you're in washington dc please sign up for an in-person one day elasticon training happening on february 1st cool 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 email for details lots of networking opportunities um olukemi said awareness training is very important despite a lot of trainings human error still remain the weak links um Anna says training is free of charge, but you do need to pre-register as soon as possible. If you come, uh, Jenny says, if you come to B-Sides Charm or Las Vegas, you will likely see me. Cool, yes. Um, uh, Teresa's replying to question 10 about, uh, replying to question 10, oh, someone, someone responded that they, they don't own a TV. A well, question 10, I believe is, um, what is your favorite hacker movie ah yes okay gotcha and somebody said they don't own a tv Teresa responds i didn't have a tv until i was in my 30s really wow uh grew up without one didn't really miss it surprising how much more you can get done without tv this i agree with uh, one of my big personal mottos is uh you know love your fellow humans and watch less tv <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i stopped um watching a lot of tv when i um, went back for um my higher education in 20 16 and i don't miss it i really don't miss it really mm -hmm. i don't miss it yeah i you know I've, I've heard that i've heard that i i think i probably would i i use it to turn my brain off so i i just kind of watch mindless stuff that doesn't require me to engage this kind of this passive entertainment that is uh i have add though i'm you know we call neuro spicy right <laughs> but um you know, so I, I have to have things like that that help to sort of relax my brain. Some noise, brown noise, white noise, whatever people want to call it, it, it actually helps me to relax a little bit, tone down, concentrate. But I do love to read. Um, I, I really love to read, which is how we all, we all ended up here. <laughs> um, uh, I, I wanted to, to switch gears here real quick and jump to um, a frequent answer to the life hack question, right? A uh, common responses to that or self-care or something related to self-care. And burnout is a common problem in our industry. A lot of women I talk to personally have either mentioned battling burnout or have actually admitted considering leaving the industry for less stressful jobs. Um, so Kiana, if you would put up question four, I wanna get the audience's thoughts on this. Um, it's, it's do you practice self-care and does it help you battle burnout, right? Um, I'm going to keep kind of looking for that, but you can just put your thoughts in chat and, until the question comes up. Uh, Trish, do you practice self-care? Yes, I do. And on some days more than others, but I feel that self-care should be incorporated into every day. So that's what I strive for um, to avoid um, burnout <clears throat> at work. 
um, you know, working home, I, you know, practice the work-life balance philosophy. So I don't feel so robotic um, day in and day out. So, yeah. at, you know, after work, I disconnect. I don't bring work home and I don't, um, from home, I don't bring my uh, problems to work. So I try not to mix those two environments. And so um, taking a short walk um, at work with my recommend, recommended breaks, like lunch break and my two 15 minute breaks. I try to do that every day. I try to meditate or just have some quiet time. Uh, you know, I listen to music. Water therapy is good. Um, I try what to get is into water therapy. You oh, so, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, it's a play on words, but taking a nice hot bath is my water therapy. Okay. And then um, I try to get into the spa, you know, um, or, you know, jacuzzi or pool. Ooh. And then, you know, just getting out, getting some fresh air um, are some of my top um, self-care practices. Okay. All right. Well, that's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so, Kiana, will you post the results of the poll for me? Go ahead and wrap that up and and we can we can touch on that real quick. Uh, okay. We got 52%. This is actually higher than I thought it would be. This is challenging my own biases, right? Yes, life balance is the only way for 52% of people when it comes to self-care. Um, so that's really great. I guess everyone is better than I am. <laughs> I answered some, I could always use more, right? Um, and then people, there's 5% say, no, I don't feel like I have the time. And then 10% self-care, what's that? Yeah, so I'm I kind of somewhere between some and like self-care, what's self-care? Uh, I think, you know, a lot of us really can just um, get wrapped up in like what I'm doing is important. It's more important than taking the time to myself or taking a break or it really does. But uh, but if you find yourself battling burnout, that's definitely, you know, I think Trisha's suggestion. So it's sometimes even just a short walk. I, I should definitely do that more than I do. <laughs> I, I need to uh, eat my own dog food, right? <laughs> um, so Another question I liked was qualities, right? What qualities do you think all successful cybersecurity professionals share? A lot of the answers I saw were curiosity, uh, tinkering mindset, which to me is a really common thing to hear in engineering circles. I don't know, some, some of y'all have engineering backgrounds. That I've, I've heard it called the knack, if you've got the knack. This is basically just someone who wants to take apart their router and figure out like, how does it work? Where do the cables go? What does this mean? You know. Um, people who take things apart, uh, really, it's, it's you know, tinkering mindset, um, passion, willingness to learn, etc. cetera. Um, I feel like that's, that's always really important. Um, Kiana, do you want to post the, the, the question five on that? What qualities? Because I want to know what, what our audience here thinks. And the, the, the reason I bring this up is because uh, I felt like, you know, a lot of those, those answers were just the same over and over again, but I want to hear what you think is the most, like which quality, and I probably should have phrased the question differently, right? But what quality do you think uh, is, is most common among successful cybersecurity professionals? And of course, with the caveat that what we all mean by successful is different, right? For some of us, that's money, some it's status, some it's just, am I making an impact? Am I making a difference? For some people, it's you know, can I can I feed my children, <laughs> right? Since we all have different different areas, um, you know, of all the cybersecurity professionals I have met, um, I I think I've I've seen the most is probably passion, but that's just my you know what I've encountered. Um, uh, Kiana, I feel like we've we've done about a, a minute of that. If you want to go ahead and, and publish those poll results, fantastic. We've got uh, curiosity and learning mindset, 72%. Wow, that's, yeah, that's that's a pretty strong statement from our audience. Absolutely, curiosity and learning mindset. Um, I'm going to pull up some of these in chat. We got quite a few things to say in chat. Uh, Okay, Tammy Rose says it's important to model self care for your coworkers, stress and despair, especially like the breaches will never stop. And you need to be stable and long term. It's true. If you think, oh, I'm going to start, you know, cybersecurity and I'm going to protect everyone 100% of the time. We know it's just not possible. Um, Jen H says 
for question five, insatiable curiosity. Yeah, Patricia Gonzalez Villa says tenacity, persistence. Jen says lots and lots of interest. I love the love of fixing things. Yeah, and I do love a good dumpster fire. <laughs> yes, yes, the strongest steel is forged in the fire of a dumpster. Uh, it's very true. I think a lot of us, believe it or not, you you can't be in this industry and not have just a little bit of an affinity for dumpster fires. <laughs> just even if it's just wanting to fix them, right? Even if it's just wanting to put them out. Um, Olukemi says passion. Teresa Reinhardt, let's see here. Oh, somebody wants to discuss ageism. Oh, I like that. Uh, Trisha, can you find that comment for me? I, I know Teresa's responding to someone, but I'm scrolling here and I don't see it. Okay, I'll look for it. Sure. Um, but yeah. we, did, we did have a question while I'm looking um, uh -huh. for it. And so let's see, Abiola, uh -huh. uh, do, do you call, can you un mic, can you um, unmute your mic um, for your question? Okay, maybe she stepped away. But her question was, how do uh -huh. you measure security awareness training success? Any suggestion on metrics used to measure? Security awareness. Can you read that again? Yes. How do you measure security awareness training success? Any suggestion uh -huh. on metrics used to measure? Well, okay, so I would say you've got a couple of things you can do, um, and I, I've run into this with, uh, we are one of our tools, we use Proofpoint Protection Service, and they, they kind of have some of these tracking things, right? Um, uh, you, you, you would want, uh, I would say there are tools out there that can do a lot of these analytics for you, depending on what training packages you purchase. If you're trying to do it internally yourself, you're going to have a harder time grabbing those metrics. But one way you could do it um, is, first of all, you just simply, who's taking it? Who's taking the training? Is HR or someone, a manager, managers, whoever's responsibility is within your organization to make sure that people are taking that training? Are they hitting those goals? Are they taking the training? Right. And then you can compare it to what your security team is seeing. Hey, listen, we get 10 people clicking on phishing links a month. Then I would say for a medium sized organization that, uh, you know, your your training sessions may not be as effective as you could hope. Right. And then other people, again, you know, scale appropriately to your organization. But, um, you know, but then then there's, you know, the other things like the tools. Right. Uh, uh, Proofpoint is just an example that comes to mind where they will say, oh, OK, you know what, you've had these five people. Um, are not only repeatedly attacked, but are repeatedly falling for it. And then you can reach out and you can do more targeted training. And in my opinion, targeted training, a lot of people go, oh, well, you just need to take training again. And I think that's silly. I think what really gets through to people is a conversation that, I mean, I don't know about any of y'all, but some of my mind is often changed and really uh, my behavior is heavily impacted. When I have an actual conversation with a human being who's there not to judge me, but to help me, but to say, hey, listen, we just, we want to help. We want to make sure you know that, you know, you're, you're being attacked more than some other people. And so it means that you're just more likely to fall for this, but let's talk about some of the ways that we can spot and avoid kind of falling for this. Um, I'm very passionate about this. If you could tell, I could go on and on about this. Um, no, that, that was great. So the um, Sher uh, Sherry Chitwood said, uh -huh. can we discuss ageism as a life hack? How do you get past the, the discrimination? Ageism is a life hack. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's it's definitely easier in the time of Zoom. You put some filters on, your wrinkles go away, right? Um, but uh, it's, so sometimes that's easier, especially if you're working fully remote. But for the rest of us, we have to live day to day in the bodies that we have and they age. And, um, and I, I agree. I mean, I think that ageism is a big challenge. Uh, especially in technical fields. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why people think old women don't matter. Um, and, and this is something I've encountered uh, myself. I'm not even that old. Um, and, but it's, it's this sense that um, like once you hit a certain age, like you're just not going to be useful or not going to contribute. Not that men don't, you know, hashtag not, a, not everyone, right? But um, you know, not, that, not that men don't experience this as well because they do. But I've, I've definitely seen ageism impact 
how we we are uh, valued in in a in an organization, and you know what people they want to see young, they want to see you know fresh. But um, on the flip side of that, I think that there is an advantage uh, in this industry specifically, in that so many employers they want that that five years experience for an entry level job. At least when they're asking for those things, they understand you're not going to get that from a twenty year old. Right, you're just not. Um, you're not going to get it from a fresh college graduate. You're not, and so they're they're probably a little more open minded in our field than some others about hiring people who are a little older. So um, hopefully that's good. Teresa's responding to this about ageism. It's like getting, it's like getting past being a woman in a male dominated field. You have to be like Ginger Rogers, who did everything Fred Astaire did, but better. In other words, you can't afford to be the one without the certs or the security clearance or the degree. And that, you know, oh, that answer, Teresa, that answer makes me sad. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with you. It just, oh, that answer just it gets to my heart. It really kind of makes me sad. You, I do feel like I have to excel beyond what some of my male teammates can do. They can show up, they can do the work, they can go home and they can not care. And I'm over here going, well, I have to get this cert and I have to be part of this organization and I have to make sure that I'm you know, not just volunteering with an organization, but, um, you know, jumping in wholeheartedly and getting on the board and making an impact and, and starting a book club and, you know, what have you, right? These things kind of all stem from the need to uh, feel like you're a valued cybersecurity professional. Um, and and, I, and not everyone's me, right? Not everyone has that experience. Trisha, what do you think about some of this that I'm saying? Or are you just following comments? Oh yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just following um, that's, comments. That's okay, totally fine. Uh, okay. Lauren John says, "Question everything." Uh, I I love that. I love that. Uh, Anna T says, "I think curiosity is very important." That's just what we do every day. It's true. Yeah, it's I do. I, I do feel sorry that women have to work so much harder and have to try to prove themselves, like on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's definitely a a right. challenge and something that we all we all try to approach. Um, right, Trisha says uh, the determination shows that you have passion, curiosity, and the desire to figure out how things work, fix them when they're not working. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Anna says in response to the ageism question, it may take some time, but it is possible to get there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jen says, oh, tenacity. I think this is another answer to question five, tenacity. Um, Dion says, we have to remember that we work to get the financial needs for our life and our families met. Self-care is directly related to happiness in our life. We are all replaceable. If our mental and physical health is not stable to work, the company will just find someone else. This is very true. Um, we have to be able to keep going and, and going, I, I would hope, with a positive mindset. Um, Jennifer Langdon says, what's cool is a lot of video games these days really help cultivate that curiosity. Unlike girl games of the 90s I grew up with. Yeah, yeah, same. Um, Olukemi says, I think passion leads to curiosity. Uh, Michelle Friedrich, probably back to the discussion of phishing, uh, phishing campaigns, number of clicks. Yeah, yeah, how many clicks people are clicking on, that that's definitely helps. Um, <clears throat> Teresa went back to the ageism question. It helps if you have all three. A clean past helps a lot. If you go over the clearance, play up your soft skills. This field does have some difficult personalities that are tolerated because of their technical abilities. This is so true. I can tell you how many awkward people I've met in this field just, and, and they, they succeed. And, and in one way, that's not always a bad thing, right? It's a, it's a good place for, like it takes all people for the world to work the way it does and having a diverse sort of mindset or having some, you know, not having any soft skills um, that can make for a whole bunch of teams that have a really hard time communicating. So just hiring people with soft skills, people with, you know, intuitive communication skills um, can really just help round out a team, even if they don't have extra special technical abilities. Managers know that middle managers don't like the time it takes to manage them. So if you can, will interface successfully with them. That's valuable. That's true. Um, that is, I think, one of the reasons that I got the job that I have is, um, you know, it wasn't just that I had 
you know, taken some classes and, and shown that I could master some of the material, but it was also because the team, you know, my, my boss even told me when I asked him, I said, you know, there's some guys that have way more experience than me. Why did you pick me? And he said, honestly, I've got plenty of tech bros. I've got plenty that, that, you know, they've got technical skills. He said, I need someone with project management background, which I have, um, someone who, you know, has soft skills, someone who can communicate well and effectively, you know, for, for this team. And I just thought, oh, that's fantastic answers. It made me feel uh, valid. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, it, it really goes, it flies in the base of that um, imposter syndrome when you're like, oh, you know, I'm validated for having my, my soft skills and my, you know, my ability to, to write and, and, you know, be detail oriented. Those things matters too. Um, Jennifer says, replying to the passion, uh, uh, comment. I I think they can feed into each other. Uh, for example, some kid curious about plants learns they are good at plants, becomes passionate about plants, and begin to self-identify as that's their thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. Um, and uh, I think the key is being open-minded. She says as well. Um, Jen H says, lots of times when you hit a certain age, you end up in charge. People forget that you have technical skills that got you there. Yeah, that's true. Um, Carolyn says, or Caroline possibly, is there a possibility to study cyber and education and graduation programs like master's or PhD? I'm in the process of career transition, but I would like to match teaching education in cyber. You know what? There absolutely is. In fact, I would say it is easier to get a master's in cyber than it is to get a bachelor's in cyber because there are so many schools that don't even have bachelor's in cyber. They, they don't. If you want a bachelor's degree and you're interested in cybersecurity, your option is to become, uh, is to get a bachelor's in IT, an IT focus. That's definitely a, a problem and a challenge. Yeah, Kiana, did you have something? Did you? Oh, um, no. Hi. <laughs> oh, oh, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, because a lot of the um, community colleges um, locally now in my area are just now starting to develop their cyber um, security criteria. So um, what um, Joanna said was true, but a master's is more easier um, to obtain. And it is easier, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. So, um, so I know we have like 12 minutes to go. Uh -huh. Do you wanna start um, wrapping up? Um, well, there was a question in the chat about the conference. So I did put the link to the um, how to register for the conference, but the general link is only going to be made available February 6th at 10 a.m. Central Time. Okay. So um, just for know. anyone that wants to know, I did put the link in the chat. I'll, I'll repost it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And okay. uh, speaking of which, I, I am going to try and just kind of start wrapping up here um, because we do have a few minutes left and, and I'm just going to piggyback I was going to talk on it later, but I'll mention it now. I was going to piggyback on what you're saying about the conference. So our surprise, our surprise that we're super excited about that you all have waited patiently for is that um, at the conference, we are going to have an in-person, uh, you know, book club meetup. It's, it's not, it's not a book discussion or a book review. It's hi, come meet me, meet Trisha, say hi, pick up some little swag and, uh, you know, just uh, come talk, talk, to us about books, about all the books that you want to talk about that you love, and you'll you'll get to meet us. Um, let's see here. I wanted to just real quick. Um, I'm going to go through this really fast. Uh, the favorite hacker movie show question. Um, I think for me it was probably Hackers. It's super cheesy and stupid fake, but. It's fun. It was just so much fun and kind of hilarious. Um, and then war games, I love about the same. I've seen it a million times. But one thing I really wanted to draw attention to, um, because I felt like this was important to knock on, um, is that most of the answers in the book, even, even from, from women and people of color, were white male-oriented films. And I think that that reflects the past few decades of the stereotype that all people in IT related roles are men. It's a stereotype, you know, um, there's a woman with dragon tattoo. That was a more recent break from tradition, but that came from a book, a best-selling book. Um, I love that Rihanna uh, was cast in uh, Ocean's 8 as the hacker role. I think her character's name was Nineball. 
Um, and, it, and it was interesting though, but it, it was like, okay, I, I didn't see that mentioned in the book once. I mean, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. Uh, not that I saw. And I'm really looking forward to seeing more diverse depictions of, of hackers and media and entertainment culture. Trisha, did you have anything to, to add to that? Well, no, my um, favorite movies are all, you know, old and probably, you know, some may not have heard, but I liked um, The Net with um, Sandra Bullock. That was like yeah. one of my first favorite um, hacker movies. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that one was fun. Yeah. I, I could watch Sandra Bullock do anything, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. Go ahead. In the chat, um, just Tammy Rose said we need to make a film of our book group. <laughs> well, let, let me get let me try and get this as a podcast working first, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah. But I, I, I agree. Good that, suggestion. That good suggestion. Yeah. Very good. Um, and so, just another touch on the book. If nothing else, this book is a really nice resource for who to follow on social media. <laughs> My LinkedIn is going to be amazing when I'm done, uh, when I'm through just following the folks that I, I got a lot out of. Uh, a lot of these people, though, uh, I've been following various forms anyway for a long time. I'm sure a few of y'all recognize the cyber superstars in this book, um, but I just want to take a moment and, and do a shout out for Marcus Carey, uh, one of the authors. I recommend everyone follow, follow him on LinkedIn. Trisha, did you... Well, yeah. Um, so we'll put his um, his info in the chat, his LinkedIn oh, yeah. link, idea. and as well as um, his Twitter handle. Cool. But I agree. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some thoughts before we wrap up. As always, my hope is that today's discussion can be a catalyst to understanding and promoting changes we wish to see, in this case, specifically in our industry. Uh, talk about the book and the ideas in it with your coworkers, your children, your spouses, and your Congress people. Um, Trisha, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I, I feel that you pretty much sum things up. Like if this was like a great discussion. Um, our previous book clubs were an hour, so we did extend it to like an hour and a half. But I wanted to share one last quote from the book for those in search of a cybersecurity career. So this is from Cheryl Biswas on page 20. And it states, confidence is important. So believe in yourself and that you have a contribution to make because you will be told no. And that is hard to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I love that quote. Okay, well, that, that's our soapbox. As an FYI, we'd like to reach out to you on occasion with notices about changes to events and book club details. And Kiana, if you would take a minute to make sure that you grab the participants today, their, their names, um, we, we may want to get your feedback with a survey regarding your thoughts um, or if we have any issues around the dates coming up. Um, the next book club would normally be the third week in March, but that is the conference. I'm so excited to tell you about Trisha and I hosting a, a meetup that that Thursday, I believe, is going to be March 16th um, in person. Uh, that's where you can come meet us. Uh, but for the next book club date, we're targeting Saturday, April 15th. So keep an eye out for the confirmation on that date in your WESIS newsletters or follow the events page on the website. The book we have chosen this time is Against All Odds, Overcoming Racial, Sexual, and Gender Harassment on the Digital Battlefield. This is by Dr. Chanel, Chanel Suggs. Um, and I can uh, put the link, the Amazon link there in chat for you uh, if you want. There we go. And it has been posted. Uh, <clears throat> now I hear some of you, I hear you right now, you're, you're yelling at me already, right? That's too long to go without discussing another book. For those of you tryhards, the Read Harder Challenge is a book called The Rise of Cyber Women, Volume 1 by Lisa Ventura and, and more. There are a lot of contributors to that book. It's uh, pretty good. Um, and we, we definitely want to uh, see you all back here again to discuss uh, this and more. We always have these really great conversations and I feel, I feel privileged to be able to, to be a part of this and to be you know, hosting this and with Trisha. Uh, Trisha, do you have anything else you wanna add on before we sign off today? Um, no, just thank you all for attending. I am um, going to save the chat with everyone's, um, either your LinkedIn, 
um, address, your Twitter handles, your email addresses. So um, we look forward to hopefully seeing um, some of you at the WESIS conference. Uh, make sure you come and introduce yourselves. It's going to be an exciting, um, you know, like introductory um, in-person event for the book club. Thank you, Joanna, for starting the book review club. Um, it was it was great. It's been great so far. So thank you, thank everyone. You.